meeting called to order at 6.04. Uh, FCAT is recording, so the Zoom meeting is not recording. I guess this is how we're doing it. Sound good? Okay. Okay, great. Um, All right, let's call to order 6.04. The, uh, it's um, June 16th, 2021. We uh, have a forum with David. 17. 17. 17, sorry. David, Gary, myself, Matt, and Jonathan. Bob and Hearn will not be here. So we have uh, forums where we can vote. All right, minutes of March 18th. Uh, did I send, uh, I think I sent out the correct minutes with the wrong date at the top and I didn't fill them out completely or something. They you looked want, a little thin. You want to hold, <coughs> off, till next, you want to hold off till next month, next meeting? I think so. Let me just make sure um, because we've got okay. some previous minutes as well. well so. and, and it's also because Zach takes the, no offense Zach, but you take the lazy man's approach to minutes where you just take the agenda and then you write stuff kind of on the minutes well the agenda if you didn't notice i'm not only taking the minutes but also basically running the meeting and giving my report so if somebody yeah, else yeah, wants yeah. to take minutes i'm happy to relinquish that duty all right so we'll, uh, <laughs> you're more than welcome to take sunday off <laughs> um, all right so we'll skip the we'll skip the, the uh voting on the minutes until uh next meeting director's report um so our budget passed without drama at all three town meetings. I was present for all three town meetings. Um, I like to be there just because for a lot of people that might be the only chance they get to pull me aside or, or see me when they get the chance. Uh, when, we, when we did the budget, um, I calculated the staff salaries based on the customary step increase and then like a 1% for people who are already maxed out. The Deerfield Personnel Committee made a different recommendation based on a class comp study that Deerfield just did and Deerfield voted something slightly different, which was 3% for everybody across the board. No step differences or anything. No steps, no COLA. Yeah, uh, no steps, no COLA, 3% for everybody. The difference between our budget and what that is, is $443. So practically speaking, there's we're not gonna run out of money or anything at the end of the year so those numbers are are, are kind of <coughs> wonky both ways but it comes out to the same amount in other words it's going to come any leftover will come out of the director's budget or director's salary perfect yeah. sounds good um i so, bet you that won't be in the minutes so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh the lazy man version yeah mm -hmm. um uh, so first order of business, not business, I should say, I'm just making words up. The, we did the first round of write-offs uh, as of South County EMS. So we had caught up to July 1st, 2014, um, a while ago. Those were all the old Deerfield EMS stuff. We're now into the South County stuff. And the first round I went through, and anything that is older than six years old um, was just written off. That was like... If it's older than six, we're not gonna collect it, so we just wrote it off. That was a total of $64,875. Um, and the Deerfield Select Board wrote that off on their July, uh, whatever that meeting was. Um, I'm going to keep, I'm gonna catch up with everything else. Um, I'll be bringing it to the Select Board fairly regularly. Going through, so we have a South County EMS write-off policy that was created and approved here last year or the year before um, based on what our neighboring communities are doing, their, those municipalities are doing. Going through this, the past due amounts and looking at how our policy would apply to it, it doesn't feel, it doesn't strike me as right. I think there's, there's some adjustment that the BOO should do to better align our written policy with the values of the Board of Oversight in the three towns. The one that really stood out to me was um, any debt, any total debt for an individual greater than $150 went to the collections agency. And, and that just feels like way too large of a net that's gonna be collecting and capturing people that um, my sense at least of the temperature in the room is we're not intending to have a collections agency go after them. Um, 
we can drill down more closely. When I get the report from Comstar, we can, it says the reason why this is past due. Maybe it's the full amount. We didn't have billing information. It's a bad address or something like that. That might be something that is a good candidate because that company has the resources to track down their new address and the new insurance or things like that. On the flip side, it might be somebody who owes $200 because it was their share of a $4,000 bill and they just couldn't afford that. And they, for whatever reason, have not applied for hardship or abatement or something like that. Maybe they're a town resident. I don't know. There's a couple things, like I said, that stood out. I'm going to kind of package that all together and bring it to the boo next time for review to see whether we like how it's written um, or there's things that we want to adjust on that. So I, my, my question that, that, Zach, is that if the only thing the person has to do is five, I, I mean, are you still going to contact these people and say, look, we'd like you to fill out a uh, our application not for payment? So the currently Comstar, as part of their billing, they send out three bills, 30, 60, 90. Yeah. And each one, and I, I reviewed and actually modified this language specifically for <clears throat> South County. It gets more and more severe, right? Like, hey, we already warned you once. But in every single one, the, the line that tells you, and there is a process if you feel that you cannot pay for you to apply for abatement, that section gets bigger and bigger. Um, and I feel is friendly. It is, we are not here to cause a hardship. Please do that. So initially, absolutely. Every 30 days, somebody is getting a letter with their bill that also enumerates how they can apply for hardship and, and under what grounds um, they could qualify. Can you, can you send that to us? Yeah. Can you, yeah, send, yeah. That, can you send that to us? So, we, so if somebody asks us, we can, we yeah. can talk about that, please. I, I struggle with collected collection agencies being involved sort of at all. Um, I realize that at some point they may be a necessary evil, but that literally should be the approach of last resort, I believe. I, I think that's that's a, a, a uh, it, it's, it's just an act that is not a friendly one. Um, and I don't want us to be a collection. I don't want our, our staff to be a collection staff either. Um, you know, that being said, the majority of collections actions are because we've exhausted the insurance. Um, it's because Medicaid and Medicare have capped at 50% or whatever. It's not because someone's um, overtly not paying their bill. I, I, I just think that a collection agency, when it comes to, to, to health care, I mean, I get hospitals do it, but I, I struggle with it. So I, I think it should be, however Zach wants to put, to get, put it together, my approach would be, would be the option of last resort. <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah, and personally, you know, I'm trying, I, like, I wanted this policy to be very objective, right? So just under these circumstances, we all agree um, and it felt, like I said, too inclusive for going to collections, and it made me uneasy personally checking the box of go to collections, go to collections, because personally I didn't like it, um, like you're saying, uh, Jonathan, and I think it wasn't in the spirit of what we're trying to do here with South County EMS. Um, I, you know, I, and we can, it's our policy. We can set it to whatever we want. You know, we could say out-of-towner who we know has insurance and is just avoiding us and they're filthy rich because their name is in the Fortune 500 and they owe over $10,000. You know, like we could we can make a policy however we want it, so. Um. I can tell you in the past, our policy had been, uh, we would try to collect whatever we could. And Jonathan, my, my instruction years ago was if it's only $5 a month that somebody can afford to pay, you know, we'll take $5 a month until they pay it off or until our finance committee and or treasurer collector deemed we've gone as far as we can. We never wanted to put somebody out of the house or cause them to miss a meal because they were paying an ambulance bill. Right? Or hurt their credit rating. Correct. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's not what we're after. Yeah. Like Zach said, we were after the folks who 
could afford to pay and didn't want to pay because they felt their insurance had paid that they didn't want to pay the balance. Right. I, I just think could afford to pay, Matt, is, is there's, there's nothing objective about it. It is subjective. Correct. Um, and I, I just, you know, and, and, and I know that you're saying $5 a month that, you know, that costs more than it brings in, in revenue in terms of person, personnel time, postage, you know, all that kind of paper, that kind of junk. Um, but I get it. I, I just, I mean, I'm just, I'm just sort of thinking out loud and I, I'm eager to see what Zach comes up with for a, and then, then we have something to bounce off of. Okay. I, you get my point, Matt? I mean, I, I get no, it. No, Jonathan, I, I completely understand. I mean, my, my biggest battle when I started that was um, between finance committee and uh, treasurer, town clerk, tax collector, making sure whatever we were doing, they were okay with. <clears throat> but yeah, let's let's get something. Let's bounce it. it. It may we may need to go back individually to our towns and, and get some further input on it. But you know, it's look we've we've come so far with this service. I think Zach's going to hit on a couple other issues based on what I've read in his report. It's time to start looking at some of this stuff and making adjustments for the way that we've grown and the way that we are doing business today. Yeah. So it's probably a healthy time to take a look at this. Yeah, okay. I appreciate I appreciate your comments and your thoughts on it because I think it's a bit more of an up to date thinking over where we may have been <clears throat> you know, eight or ten years ago. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, so the the next thing that I'm going to talk about, and I think really. Um, we're just out of budget season. Um, we've got the summer and the fall ahead of us where I think is going to be a good time to start thinking about kind of those bigger picture problems, the non-immediate problems. Um, and so I'm going to segue into what I see our department now. I, we're entering our eighth year as South County EMS. Um, and that is, I, like, I kind of... I, Gary Ponce and I were chatting earlier and he said, you know, we've really like, we've graduated kindergarten and we're going into the first grade. And it's time that like, okay, like we have more responsibility to ourselves, to our staff, to our communities now. Um, and really what is the next thing? I think you'd be hard pressed to find anybody who would suggest our medicine needs work or our level of care or the quality of people that we have needs work. And so looking forward, I'm kind of turning internally to see how can we be a better department, um, whether it be our culture, whether it be how we're supporting <clears throat> our own staff, things like that um, for the future. Uh, part of this is just plainly the amount of staff that we have. And I think this, I think has, you know, we anticipated this a long time that eventually, because of our success, our call volume is going to get to a point where we need to start reevaluating how many full-time people we have on. Um, the, the eight full-time staff that we have for our ambulance, that's what Bruce Baxter said we would need back in 2014 based on those call volumes. Um, we, were in, uh, we were in service six months of 2014, so 2015, our first full year, we did 800 calls for service. Um, and we're on track for 1,200 this year. And that is a 50% increase from when we started. Right now, our staffing is what in public safety we call minimum staffing. It is the minimum we need to do our job. So to get an ambulance out the door and pick a patient up and transport them to the hospital, you need two people. And that is how we are staffed 24 seven. We add per diem employees uh, during the day for our busiest hours, 10 to 6, um, that is when they are available. We don't pay overtime to fill those shifts. Um, they may be unreliable um, as far as how often we can fill them. And if a full-timer calls out, you know, they, they would hopefully fill back in. But it also means that when we have people out either sick that we're not expecting or taking their vacation, which I would encourage them to do, or on maternity leave, which I don't want to discourage or anything like that, we fall below minimum staffing. And so we are at a point immediately upon somebody calling out sick or needing an hour or two at the beginning or the end of their shift, 
where we can no longer provide the service that we want to. Um, so in the past three weeks, uh, we have one employee out on maternity leave right now. Um, that's 40 hours we need to fill. We can weather 40 hours a week with our per diems. I had another full-timer get injured outside of work. They are out for at least a week and a half or two weeks because of their injuries. Now we're at 80 hours. Mm -hmm. I had somebody else who had been planning a family vacation for six months. I wasn't going to tell him that he can't do it, right? So there's another 40 hours. Um, and in the last three weeks, we've averaged 130 hours a week just to keep our ambulance staffed with two people. Um, this is obviously an extreme. Um, we've been able to get our per diems to fill those shifts, but we're asking a lot of them, and there's a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, next week isn't going to be nearly as bad. The week after that will be even better. Um, but it just reinforced my position that, like, moving forward, not today, not even next week, but moving forward next year, three years, five years, ten years, what are we envisioning? What are we looking at? Um, and I think not, even just with our native call volume, we're going to have to add <clears throat> more full-time staff to make sure that we have people here. Um, the per diems that we have are wonderful, but they have full-time jobs at fire departments and other services. You have to to be a paramedic. You can't do it um, as a hobby. So that's kind of, I, I want to emotionally prepare the Board of Oversight for this conversation, for this debate um, coming up about what our staffing looks like. We have this leftover on-call stipend where you get $8 an hour for being on call overnight. When A1 goes out, you travel to the station and you stay at the station um, ready for the next call until they leave. Uh, that's predicated on the notion we have local EMTs. And the whole reason we regionalize is because we don't have local EMTs. Um, that is a fair amount of budget that we roll over every year to keep funding that program, but I think might be better served being reallocated to more staff in uniform at the station ready to go all the time um, and to get us above that minimum staffing. So if somebody calls out sick at 6 a.m., I can say, well, it's safe to run a little light for the next four hours until we find somebody to come in versus... Oh no, I've got 30 minutes to find somebody, otherwise this ambulance can't, can't do its job. Um, that is, I, I will be looking at those numbers, I think even moving money from that on call to another staff, it's going to end up costing us money. We're responsible for all the benefits and all that stuff too. Um, so this would not be a proposition that we could break even on. Um, so there's that. Uh, the other thing that I think is easier to achieve, more immediate, um, and definitely culturally something that is important is that we have grown to the point where we're beyond just the local volunteers who now work full time and work on an ambulance. <clears throat> we are a bona fide public safety agency and the infrastructure internally isn't supporting our operations and it isn't supporting the people in the department. Um, if I have somebody, uh, I'm thinking of one in particular right now, a outstanding full-time employee who thought they wanted to do something else, we're gonna go to school for it and then decided, you know what, I love it here, I wanna do this for my career, I love South County. For them, looking forward, there isn't a clear path of growth. Um, at a, another municipality, um, at a, even another private service, there is career growth as far as supervisor, um, command staff, lieutenant, captain, things like that. Um, and then on the flip side, we have something called mentors here, which are our full-time employees with a lot of experience. They brought it from outside and they are volunteering themselves to be mentors and train new people. Um, and I'm very thankful for them, but because they are volunteering, I'm cognizant of what I'm asking them to do. And even when an ask sounds like an order coming from the boss, um, they are hired at a job description that is, you are a paramedic on an ambulance. That's it. 
my proposition and I would bring a formal thing of what that looks like is to find a way to do some sort of stipend for field training officer, for a supervisor, something like that. A clear, <clears throat> delineated job description about these are your responsibilities, um, this is what we expect of you. It's a target if you want to advance in your career. This is the things that I should work on, the skill sets that I should be able to show. Um, and then with that, we can select internally, promote, and then provide, off the top of my head as an example, like a dollar an hour stipend for that extra responsibility. With that clear job description, with those responsibilities, it would also give an opportunity to not just promote, but demote instead of just promoting people into new grades or whatever and then they don't have the skill set for the job and your only options are to either leave them in a job they're not good at or fire them by doing a separate stipend kind of thing you work both ways. it works both ways so <clears throat> you can say yeah i think you've got what it takes let's try this we can try it on for size we can work on that and build staff and promote individuals in the advancement of the career um, so how, how, but how, how would that work if, the, the only problem I see, Zach, is that you have a small department. Right. Okay. So, so now you're going to be training David. David wants to become more, more involved with management. David works on it for three or four years. He's got all the experience. Now Zach's not going anywhere. Yeah. So now we're training him to take over someplace else. So at, at a, at a fire department, what you would have is. And obviously, fire departments are typically larger, but you have different levels of staff, and you might have a captain who is in charge of training. So the training captain slot is open if somebody wants that with the extra responsibility. So it's a way of delegating those responsibilities, mm -hmm. doing it that way. Um, we are a small department. Um, we are growing both in culture and literal size, if I'm looking five, ten years down the line. And there is a there is a gap of supervision. Um, we lean very very heavily now on recruiting and retaining people who don't need supervision. Um, those are our per diems. They have at least ten years of experience. Things like that. Um, on the police department, if you look at Deerfield Police, they are the same size as us. It full time. We have more per diems than they do. We have and they have sergeants because you have that level of responsibility and problem solving that is recognizable on both directions and gives that clear career path. Um, I, there's, when, when I go home, there is no command staff anymore. Um, and for the most part, that's not a problem. But as we start adding staff and we have multiple people on duty, to have somebody whose responsibility it is to say, hey, get up off the couch, we're gonna go practice our CPR right now. Um, and have that mentorship that is tied to an actual recognition of what they do, um, figuratively and literally. Um, yeah. Just I just want to throw in, in my two cents. I, I think that's great. Um, and so I, but I, I have two comments. Um, first, just in, in quick response to Tom, I, I'm okay with training people for their next step in their career ladder, regardless of whether it's in our operation or someone else. I think mean, that, that's pretty common when you do any professional development for any organization of any scale. Usually, it's with the understanding of that person might. Um, might claim the ladder, inter ladder internally, but you also might be preparing them to, to, to move on to, to, to sunnier, sunnier pathways. And, and I'm okay with that. That's just, nothing is static, everything's dynamic. And, and if we can help someone grow their career, that means they're gonna work extra, all, all the harder for us while they are here. That's just my opinion. Um, and, and then the cautionary tale for Zach would be, if you're gonna pay someone the extra dollar or two or whatever it is, for that management training level, and you're going to add to their job responsibilities, it, it, it means that it's another series of metrics that you have to follow during evaluation. And you want to be cognizant of, you want to make sure you can actually follow through on that 
oversight and be and be a good and be a good boss and help them grow because if you don't give the feedback then you didn't help them. so just and I, you're probably saying stuff you already know and thought about but you know there are only so many hours in the day but it's another thing that you've got to evaluate and you have no mechanism to evaluate whether they're when they say hey let's get off the couch and go train or let's go clean something were they good about it or were they a jerk about it? And if you're not there, you know, so how are you gonna evaluate it? It just adds to the onus on you and, you know, you already work pretty hard, I think. <laughs> well, I guess I'll, I'll take it a step further. I think this might provide an opportunity for people within the organization who are looking for leadership opportunities to grab some of those things that maybe you haven't had time to do that because you've been so busy so focused on developing and, and leading the organization, you know, could you get somebody who's a supervisor who also takes on some of that public outreach? And maybe as part of their job, they're reaching out to between the schools and maybe some of the larger local employers to develop those relationships to get in and work with employees or work with their safety teams to make people more comfortable when they need you know, when there's a need for an ambulance. Um, you know, you mentioned the fire department. I know, you know, in their structure, they would have a training officer, you know, they've got somebody who does inspections, they've got different pieces that they do. The police department as well. And I know our police chief is used as an opportunity for officers who are looking to stay within the department to grow their skill sets so that as those opportunities open up, they've had some different exposure and they have some additional things that they can bring to the table versus, oh my God, Zach's ready for retirement. We've got a great bunch of people inside the department, but nobody has really led anything. Is there anybody that we really trust to lead the organization because they don't have that experience? And to John's point, hey, I'm, I'm great. I, look, I don't want to lose anybody, especially good paramedics, EMTs, but I also don't want to hold anybody back who's got the desire and the skill set to go lead a department if that's their path. You know, I'm, I'm thankful for whatever service that they give us, but if it comes a point in time that they're ready to go and spread their wings and, and be the chief of a department somewhere, good for them. Hopefully they remember where they came from and it'll just build a stronger relationship between us and whatever their department is. I'm with Matt on that. Yeah, I think probably our turnover or lack thereof speaks volumes about um, how people see their roles here and see their jobs. And I feel like we're at the point now, eight years in, um, and I'm seeing more tangible evidence of it that the department is failing the staff the other way. That where they're happy to be here and they're giving a lot, but they're really volunteering what they're giving. And, and to have that extra little carrot to say, I see what you're doing, you're doing a great job, how about you do it officially? Um, and to Jonathan's point, here is the metric, here is the job description for what this dollar represents, and, and it's an agreement between the department and the individual to, um, to elevate both. Um, but we can't, see, and my point is that's fine, but we, going back to a small department, the, when you're in a small department, you have to work, and you can't create non-working positions. So Sergeant and Sundown still runs a shift, okay? And, and, and that's why I'm worried, is that all of a sudden you, you start not, ha not having working positions. And the other problem with a small department, you may not have those people available that are worthy of those positions. And so are you putting positions, people in those positions because there's a position to be, that's open. So they're, they're, I, and, and again, I'm not against it, but I think that just to say you're gonna give somebody a dollar an hour and, and you can, and, and again, from my experiences, you have to hire the right people. And if you don't hire the right people, you're gonna be suffering for a while. And, and so I, I think there, there's more, it, when you when you hire a paramedic EMT right now, you don't hire that person asking them if they have leadership capabilities. 
So, and, and again, I, I just, I, again, I don't have a problem with it, but I think it needs, there's a lot of work to be done instead of just saying, well, we're going to give somebody a dollar an hour to be a mentor. Because mentoring, to tell you the truth, in the, in the public sector, mentoring is something that is done by people that want to advance. They don't mentor because they get a dollar an hour more. They mentor because they want to advance, and that's how they, they, they can get to advance, by showing their bosses they're mentoring people. Yeah, I think the I think the additional pay is just recognition on our part of the extra effort that they they're putting in to to do that mentoring or whatever the additional responsibility. Is. Understood. You just have to be careful trying to groom somebody for certain positions, and you, then there's no place for them to go. Then they start shopping around, you know, looking for yeah. another job too. So yeah. it's it's always a yeah. gamble. I mean, yeah, nothing um, you gotta do about it, but. <laughs> Yeah, I, at South County, we have we, we are both extremely attractive to really good candidates because if you want to be a paramedic, you want to work for a municipality that supports you. And typically the only option for that is to also be a firefighter. And there's a lot of culture that comes along with that at fire departments and finding the right fire department with that can be a challenge. And I know quite a few people who want to be paramedics and they're forced to be firefighters instead. So we have the benefit of being able to target those people who love to do EMS. The downside is we're a small department and, and for somebody who wants to make a career out of it, uh, right, exactly. If I, if I work to get hired here at 26, 27, then what? You know, am I a paramedic on the truck forever? Or, you know, if I were at Northampton, I could make lieutenant and then I could take the captain's exam and then I could be a deputy and all those things. So I think we are and we've always been at South County kind of that middle ground, right? Too many calls to do it with volunteers, too few calls to do it with full time staff, like the, those types of problems. And um, I see this as a as a signal that, that we are looking towards the future, we are honoring the people we have. Um, and, and maybe, you know, maybe we decide we have a position for two field training officers or two supervisors or whatever we call it, two mentors, and we never add any more in the next 10 years, maybe. But if we, if we showed a need for it now, that might be enough for somebody to say, you know what, like I, I am gonna, I would rather stay here for that than think that this department doesn't even look towards the future or something. So uh, that's, I, it sounds like we're all as enthusiastic as I am. I, I share the same, the same hesitancies um, and it would be something that, um, I would be making a presentation about what I thought it looked like and I'm just, preparing everybody for that presentation sometime in the future. Um, Thank you, Zach. You know, stepping, stepping back from this into your original thought, staffing-wise, an additional full-time staffing, Zach, you know, I, I apologize. I didn't realize it had been seven, eight years since that we're going on this, but I do remember those conversations with Bruce early on about minimum staffing. Part of the concern early on was too many full-time people and not enough room for those who wanted to volunteer and stay involved. And I think we've grown to a point where you don't have the local volunteers like we thought we would. Bruce told us, you know, one to three years, you're gonna see the volunteerism you know, slip away and you're gonna be pushing for more full-timers. So, you know, if, if the direction we need to go in is to start looking at that full-time staff and laying out a plan, I would rather us begin discussing it now and laying out a plan so we're ready and so that we've got it on the horizon and we can start vocalizing it with finance boards as we go forward with budgets, then wait and in, you know, two years it becomes a crisis and oh my God, we've got to add two or three additional bodies right now to, to get this thing done. And, and, it, and it'll be a trade-off because, and again, I, maybe I missed how much, how many hours our per diems are taking right now and, and maybe it's insignificant, but if it's still a decent chunk of hours, and, and, and we're gonna lose some of those, then the budget impact is, is not that great because it's just robbing Peter to pay Paul. 
Yeah, I think yeah, the the you're right where we it would incur more expenses is through the benefits, through the health insurance, and that's because we're responsible for it. Um but th you're right, that would be the difference um to cover those hours. <clears throat> yeah. And to cite the increase in, in, in runs that we're doing, I mean, it's just another example, and, and, and I'm going to echo what Tom always says. It's an example of how good we've gotten at what we do and the impact we have on our respective communities, and that's just part of growing up. So, um, you guys, I am going to take this opportunity to um, say goodnight to everybody. I've got to run to another Zoom meeting for, for my job, so... Um, you guys are great. See you, Jonathan. Thanks. Have a, have a great night, everybody. Bye. Thank you, John. So we can elect you now, a secretary. When yeah, do gone. I hear a motion? <laughs> <laughs> now the meeting will just zip right on by. <laughs> um, okay. yeah, on a positive note, I ran into Jim Williams up at the Bow Club uh, about two months ago. Jim, longtime Turner's Balls firefighter, uh, paramedic, yep. and years and years of experience. He was on South County service. He explained to me that he was stepping back from South County, still involved with training. And I asked him, I said, Jim, please be honest with me. Did you feel, were you forced out? Was there something that you didn't like? Was there something, he said, Matt, stop right there. He said, I love working in South County. I enjoyed my experience there. He says, I don't know if you've noticed, I'm old. He says, I can't physically do this like I used to. Was that Jim Bartis? And hmm. I'd rather do the training. He says, if I physically could do it, I'd still be there. He says, they've got a great culture. It's a great team. I said, anything we can improve on. He says, you are such an improvement over what everybody else offers. He says, it, it's like the creme de la creme <clears throat> of EMS services. So kudos to Zach and team for what they do it was very nice to hear those kind of His words son's involved involved in service. Service. Right. many years right. of experience hmm. yeah. he's a pa yeah. um yeah that's uh bardis senior bardis junior is a pa at cooley dickinson yeah yeah former paramedic at bay state health in greenfield yeah yeah um that family's a dynasty as far as emergency yeah. medicine goes the bad thing about I it? apologize. It's Jim Williams, not Jim yeah. Jim Senior was a student of mine. <laughs> you see, <laughs> never miss an opportunity to date yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, that's it. That's it as far as my director's report goes. I don't know if there was anything else um, on the agenda that hasn't been touched on. Uh, What's our next meeting, Zach? Next meeting, September 16th. September 16th. Um, yeah, I did read it. Yeah, <laughs> July, August. So that's three months from now, September 16th. So are, are, are you all set? The Deerfield is all set budget. They're not. So you're, you don't have to do anything else? No. Okay. Well, actually, we do have to revote the omnibus budget because it was off. At 30 cents? Yeah. It's some stupid, oh my god, ridiculous <laughs> amount. Of so. Yeah, I know. But it's exactly. Did you ever get the exhaust system put in? Oh, um, so the exhaust source capture system and the extra pavement, mm -hmm. um, both approved at Deerfield Town Meeting to be paid for out of the rent account. Um, okay. Um, so that did get approved at Capital. Um, will both of those things, my, I'll be working with Kevin Scarborough at, uh, the Deerfield superintendent, highway superintendent, public works, um, because one, he's the guy who knows asphalt, um, and those contacts and, and what the bid would need to read. And also he's on the South Deerfield Fire Department and they recently went through the bid process to install their own exhaust system. So he has firsthand experience in both of those things. So I'll be coordinating with him to get that project rolling here. Thank you for reminding me of that. The, uh, the new guidelines for ARPA, which we don't have yet, some of it's ventilation and you might be able to, or we might be able to dovetail it. To Good. 
ARPA funds. Okay, great. American recovery. Love it. Uh, I guess I know we're doing ventilation in the town hall with it. Yeah. And some other things. So we, well, and we it's, took it out of Capital One. Yeah. Well, and it's an OSHA standard, you know, yeah. for for the the carcinogens and the diesel. Um, so. Yeah. Uh, this skip things. I liked I ha how I reminded him how retained earnings worked. That was fun too. Oh. Um, that's all I'll say. I wanted to walk you? out of two meetings this year, so. <laughs> Are you going to have any budgetary impact from the Juneteenth holiday being approved? Uh, or staff? It works out to an additional $2,000 that we would spend. So um, eight times. Eight times, eight times whatever the average rate is. Yeah. Okay. Um, for, for backfill and, and things like that. So, um, no measurable impact is what I'll say on that on our, okay. our budget. Okay. You ready for uh, adjournment? I am. Next meeting we said was September sixteenth. Um. Any, any comments? Matt. No, I'm all good. Thank you. David. Gary. Mm -hmm. Any uh, comments from uh, the public? <laughs> Not hearing any comments from the public. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. second. And a second. All those in. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Okay. Yeah, please we'll adjourn us at uh, six forty-five p.m. with a uh, unanimous vote. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Hey, see you at the club.